very much for joining and apologies for the mishap. Simultaneous translation is again provided in the six official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian. And we have Portuguese and Hindi additionally. Now let me introduce the participants in the room. Uh, of course, first we have Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General. Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, Technical Lead on COVID-19. Dr. Bruce Aylwood, Senior Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on ACT Accelerator. We have also Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director for Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals. We have a number of colleagues online as well, and uh, we're being joined by Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Rogerio Gaspar, Director for Regulation and Prequalification, and last but not least, Dr. Sylvie Briand, Director for Global Infectious Hazards Preparedness. With this, we're ready to go, and I'm handing to the Director General for the opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Last week, more than 15 million new cases of COVID-19 were reported to WHO from around the world, by far the most cases reported in a single week. And we know this is an underestimate. This huge spike in infections is being driven by the Omicron variant which is rapidly replacing Delta in almost all countries. However, the number of weekly reported deaths has remained stable since October last year, at an average of 48,000 deaths a week. While the number of patients being hospitalized is increasing in most countries, it's not at the level seen in previous waves. This is possibly due to the reduced severity of Omicron, as well as widespread immunity from vaccination or previous infection. But let's be clear, while Omicron causes less severe disease than Delta, it remains a dangerous virus, particularly for those who are unvaccinated. Almost 50,000 deaths a week is 50,000 deaths too many. Learning to live with this virus does not mean we can or should accept this number of deaths. We must not allow this virus a free ride or wave the white flag, especially when so many people around the world remain unvaccinated. In Africa, more than 85% of people are yet to receive a single dose of vaccine. We cannot end the acute phase of the pandemic unless we close this gap. We're making progress. In December, COVAX shipped more than double the number of doses it shipped in November. And in the coming days, we expect COVAX to ship its one billion vaccine dose. Some of the supply constraints we faced last year are now starting to ease, but we still have a long way to go to reach our target of vaccinating 70% of the population of every country by the middle of this year. 90 countries have still not reached the 40% target, and 36 of those countries have vaccinated less than 10% of their populations. WHO and our partners are actively supporting these countries to overcome the bottlenecks they face in leadership and coordination, lack of supply visibility, short shelf life of donated vaccines, limited cold chain capacity, vaccine confidence, health worker shortages, and competing priorities. WHO is also paying careful attention to the impact of Omicron on vaccines. In September last year, WHO established the Technical Advisory Group on COVID-19 Vaccine Composition, or TACOVAC, a group of experts to review the implications of variants of concern 
on the composition of vaccines. Yesterday, Takovac emphasized the urgent need for broader access to the vaccines we have and that further vaccines are needed that have a greater impact on preventing infection and transmission. Until such vaccines are developed, the composition of current COVID-19 vaccines may need to be updated to ensure they continue to provide WHO recommended levels of protection against infection and disease. Tagkovac also said that a vaccination strategy based on repeated booster doses of the original vaccine composition is unlikely to be sustainable. The group also emphasized that while some countries recommend boosters, the immediate priority for the world is accelerating access to primary vaccination, particularly for groups at greater risk of developing severe disease. The overwhelming majority of people admitted to hospitals around the world are unvaccinated. While vaccines remain very effective at preventing severe disease and death, they do not fully prevent transmission. More transmission means more hospitalizations, more deaths, more people off work, including teachers and health workers, and more risk for of another variant emerging that's even more transmissible and more deadly than Omicron. The sheer number of cases also means more pressure on already overburdened and exhausted health workers. Protecting those most at risk also helps to protect health systems and health workers, which are once again under increased strain because of the burden of Omicron. A study published last year showed that more than one in four health workers globally have experienced mental health issues during the pandemic. And data from several countries show that many health workers have considered leaving or have left their jobs because of poor working conditions, insufficient staffing, and the distress of making life and death decisions every day under intense pressure. Health workers have done their best to protect us from for two years. We must all do our part to protect them by getting vaccinated and by taking precautions to prevent becoming infected or infecting someone else. And we must remember that COVID-19 is only one challenge that health workers face every day. Taking the pressure off health systems will enable them to deal with the many other challenges they face, including providing care for pregnant women. Yesterday, WHO hosted a global webinar attended by clinicians from around the world on the clinical management of COVID-19 during pregnancy, childbirth, and the early postnatal period. Pregnant women are not a higher risk of contracting COVID-19, but if they're infected, they're at higher risk for severe disease. That's why it's vital that pregnant women in all countries have access to vaccines to protect their own lives and those of their babies. We also call for pregnant women to be included in clinical trials for new treatments and vaccines. Fortunately, mother-to-baby transmission in utero or during birth is very rare, and no active virus has been identified in breast milk. We're also concerned by reports from some countries about women who have been separated from their newborn babies, which is unnecessary and can be harmful to the health and well-being of newborns during the critical first days after birth. All women have the right to a safe and positive pregnancy and childbirth experience and need high-quality, respectful maternity care.
Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Let me now open the floor to questions from the media. The first on my list is Jason Bouvier from NPR. Jason, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for taking my question. Um, as Dr. Tedros just mentioned, there are 36 countries in the world that have uh, less than 10% of their Jason, population Jason, vaccinated. Jason, yes. can I ask you to speak uh, up a bit? Because it's really hard to understand. Yes. Okay, I'll talk, talk louder. I hope this is better. Good. Um, good. As, as Dr. Tedros just mentioned, uh, there are 36 countries that have less than 10% of their populations fully vaccinated. We have heard a lot about access to vaccines as, as a barrier, but I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about particularly those countries that have really struggled to get above 10% uh, vaccinated, and what are some of the other issues that are leading to some of these low vaccination rates? Thank you very much, and I think uh, we'll start with Dr. Mike Ryan. No? Oh, Kate O'Brien, of course, the Director for Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals. Thanks so much for this question. Um, this is such a critical issue because countries that are struggling uh, to get even above 10%, what this really means is that healthcare workers uh, are not fully vaccinated yet. It means that those who are in older age populations, those who have underlying medical conditions, um, these are the people at highest risk, uh, are not fully protected yet. And so the reasons for uh, countries which are below 10% are actually quite a wide range of reasons. First and foremost, the reason is around supply that has um, been constrained, as you well know, over this past year. And any vaccine program is going to struggle to stand up a program if it doesn't know when it's getting doses, how many doses, of which product. So that is sort of the underpinning, the sort of foundational issue that many countries are struggling with. But beyond that, um, there are a number of issues. Um, and, and these are in no particular order, but um, are a range of things that countries struggle with. Um, the first is on financing. Uh, a campaign like a COVID vaccine campaign does require funding to um, deploy to new health workers to um, assure that the clinics have the resources that they need, uh, the campaigns have the resources. Um, and securing the funding in a timely and in a predictable way is really important. The second is that many of these countries have weak health systems to start with or are in conflict settings or in fragile settings. Um, there may be humanitarian emergencies. There may be um, uh, uh, other, other issues that the country is struggling with. And so to add on to um, the deployment of all health services, these other things, healthcare workers who are the ones who need to actually deploy vaccines, countries are also facing um, concerns from populations about uh, the vaccines that are being uh, uh, received and deployed into countries. And we've seen a lot of different countries making choices around vaccines. Um, and these are uh, issues of concern to people in the, in the country as well. Um, the other thing is the um, really strong commitment from leadership of countries around what their targets are and uh, having decisions in countries about exactly what the targets will be in what time frame. And that's what I think is so helpful um, about the targets that have been set by WHO to help guide countries around uh, what, what the trajectory uh, might be. And then a couple of other things that I would mention is certainly the cold chain capacity where there have been a lot of investments to help countries um, increase that cold chain capacity to be able to um, secure not only what is needed for these vaccines, but for other commodities that are coming through in the country. So these are a range of issues um, that uh, there's no one specific problem that is across all of the countries. It really is a country by country uh, tailoring of understanding exactly what the country needs um, to be able to help the country uh, accelerate uh, vaccination. And we have seen that acceleration, especially when supply is secured and is in, and is in a predictable way. Um, many of the other pieces fall into place. Thank you very much. And Dr. Bruce Aylward, please. 
No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian. And uh, Jason, thanks for this really important question because there's a dangerous narrative emerging in many high income and high coverage countries about the low vaccination uh, rates in some lower income countries or countries with weak immunization or health systems. And that narrative is you're hearing more and more is um, countries can't use these vaccines or countries don't work, uh, 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 don't want these vaccines, as you mentioned. And so there's two points just to emphasize further to what Kate uh, said, Jason. The first is, if you look at those maps and then look at a map of polio around the world or measles, and you'll see that the same countries that have got very low coverage for, um, for COVID-19 have eliminated or eradicated polio or eliminated measles or achieved very high routine immunization from other uh, uh, diseases. And so then, Jason, we got to stand back and say, OK, why is that? And a big part of the problem is we've made it twice as hard or three times as hard for low-income countries, many of them, to be able to achieve high coverage. We have to be really clear on that. Well, we did not share vaccines for six months, seven months, eight months. What we did share was a lot of misinformation, a lot of bad practice, a lot of problems. So now, as we are starting to get vaccines and huge uh, here uh, um, recognition of the work of COVAX, as, uh, as the Director General mentioned, that the organizations working together will have shipped nearly, nearly a billion doses, 980 million doses as of today. So, so watch that number. But um, that demonstrates COVAX can deliver and deliver at scale and get vaccines to these countries. But the challenge we have now is it's very late. And these countries have a much more difficult problem because they're dealing with the challenges around information. They've not had the investments always in the financing side, as Kate said. And then they've also had the problems um, associated with, uh, with, with some of uh, the donated products. Um, some countries are sending vaccines that they don't want, and low-income countries know that, and then they have to work with their own populations. They're getting vaccines that have got short expiry dates, which make them very, very difficult to use in complex environments, and expiry dates that are shorter than the countries donating them will actually accept themselves often. So I just want to be you know, very frank, Jason, that these are countries that have, many of them that are red on the map, have achieved very high coverage for immunization against other diseases and eradicate and eliminate diseases. They know how to run vaccination at scale. It's really tough environment they're operating in right now. How do we fix that? Number one, we have to provide full support, the financing for the delivery, the information support, the right products, the right timeframes. There's so much we can do um, because these countries know how to get to their populations. They know how to turn on the machinery. They know how to get uh, people vaccinated. They have a fantastic track record, most of them. Thank you very much, both. Next question goes to Jamil Shad from O Estado de Sao Paulo. Jamil, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello to everyone. Um, my question, uh, if you allow, Christian, uh, will be in Portuguese because I have to read a, 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 a statement by President Bolsonaro on Omicron. Is that okay if I do it in Portuguese? Let us try if that works, yes, please. We should have Portuguese translation. Very good. So the statement is by President Bolsonaro made today. Uh, Omicron já espalhou pelo mundo todo como as próprias pessoas que entendem de verdade dizem que ela tem uma capacidade de difundir muito grande, mas a letalidade muito pequena. Dizem até que seria um vírus vacinal, segundo algumas pessoas estudiosas e sérias e não vinculadas às empresas farmacêuticas, dizem que a Omicron é bem-vinda e pode sim sinalizar o fim da pandemia e que a variante não tem matado ninguém. My question to you, uh, the fact that President Bolsonaro claims that it has not killed anyone, that Omicron has not killed anyone, and that it could be a vaccinal virus and is welcome, uh, is this a statement uh, that, let's say, let's say uh, tranquilizes you all? Thank you. Jamil, can I ask you to repeat your question as such, please, because we're not quite clear what you're asking. My question is, is Omicron uh, welcome, as said by President Bolsonaro today, 
And is it a um, uh, is it true that it has not killed anyone? Thank you very much. I'm asking Dr. Mike Ryan to start. Sorry, thank you. No, I, I'm not aware of, 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 of any such statements, but I think the, the Director General was, was clear in his remarks that while Omicron may be less severe as an individual virus infection in an individual, that this does not mean this is a mild disease. And uh, there are many, many people uh, around the world as we speak in hospital, in ICUs, on ventilators, uh, uh, gasping for their breath, on oxygen, uh, who would uh, obviously uh, be very clear that this is not uh, a mild disease. Um, it is a vaccine-preventable disease. Uh, it is a disease that can be prevented by taking, uh, to a great extent, by taking uh, strong personal precautions to avoid infection, getting vaccinated, and there are things we can do about it. And I think um, it's very, very important that we remember that it's still in our hands. Uh, Maria says this a lot. The Director General says this a lot. There's much we can do, and this is not the time to give up. This is not the time to give in. This is not the time uh, to declare uh, that this is a, a welcome uh, virus. Uh, no virus is welcome that kills people, um, and especially when that's, in, to a great extent, that mortality and that suffering is preventable through the uh, appropriate use of vaccination. So. Uh, uh, I do, I'm not aware of the specific comments made by any individual on this, but I will point you to the comments made by the Director General in his speech. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. We'll move to the next, and that's Bayram Altuk from Anadolu News Agency. Bayram, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Christian, for taking my question. Um, Hans Kluger, the WHO's Europe uh, Director, said yesterday that more than 50% of uh, Europe's population will be infected with the Omicron variant if the, uh, in the next uh, six, eight weeks. So does this scenario apply to the whole world? In other words, do you expect as WHO Geneva headquarters that more than half of the world's population will be infected with Omicron variant in the next two months if the current uh, trends and rates continue? If your answer is yes, are we able to see light at the end of the tunnel? Or is there, a, is there a realistic hope that the pandemic will end soon because of mass immunity issues? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bayram. Let's start with Dr. Maria van Kerkhove. Yes, thank you. So you're referring to comments made by our RD Euro uh, director on a model um, that was looking at uh, future scenarios of COVID-19, in particular the Omicron variant and circulation of the Omicron variant. What we definitely see with this variant is that it, uh, it transmits incredibly efficiently between people. And you've seen that in the epidemic curve that we published last night uh, online. Um, and the Director General commented today, uh, more than 15 million cases reported in a seven day period. Um, we had to change the scale of the epidemic curve that we published last night because it's, it's such an astounding number. Um, and certainly if we allow this virus to continue to spread as it is, um, we will see high, higher numbers of cases in the coming weeks. I think the point um, of us sitting up here and speaking every day uh, and doing these press conferences, issuing guidance, issuing strategies, is that we have tools at hand that can prevent something that's predicted in a model from actually happening. We said this in the beginning of this pandemic. There were a lot of models that came out that gave very scary predictions about what would happen if we didn't act if we didn't take this as seriously as it needed to be taken. We're in that situation again. There is no inevitability about this virus and how it circulates. We have control, some measure of control, in terms of limiting its spread with tools that we have access to, masks, distancing, ventilation, avoiding crowds, um, knowing what our risk is every day and taking measures to lower that risk. At the present time, we're not able to prevent all infections, but we can limit the spread and we can reduce the sheer number of cases that are occurring right now. We can also reduce the severity of COVID-19 with vaccination, with earlier clinical care, uh, with access to diagnosis to get patients into the clinical care pathway so that they can receive earlier clinical care. 
So I think we need to look at these models um, as ways to help us plan, uh, as ways to look at scenarios going forward. And we as WHO are looking at a number of different models, a number of different future scenarios in terms of case predictions, in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, also looking at potential scenarios of, of how much further this virus will evolve because the virus is spreading and it's continuing to evolve. But these models are just that. They are tools that help us plan and take direction and take action. So what we are asking is everyone to help us reduce the spread because the sheer volume of cases is putting a burden on healthcare systems. Because even though Omicron uh, is less severe than Delta, it still is putting people in hospital. It is still putting people into ICU and needing advanced clinical care. It is still killing people. And so the more people that end up in hospital and fill up those beds from COVID-19, they take beds away from other emergencies that need to be cared for as well. And our healthcare systems around the world are significantly overburdened. So we need everyone's help right now to, as Bruce says often, to take the heat out of this uh, epidemic that we're in right now, the latest wave of infections that we see. Um, and we don't have to actually have these models um, come to fruition. So Dr. Elad, please. Uh, thanks, Christian. And Brian, uh, just to add to the point that Maria made, you know, our regional director is ringing an alarm bell. And if you look, go on the WHO website and have a look at the epidemic curve that Maria just referred to. It's absolutely staggering. We have not, you know, in 30 years of working on infectious diseases, have not seen an epidemic curve like this before. Uh, certainly not in a in a with a pandemic-prone virus. And in the face of a staggering upsurge of disease like that, um, you know, there, there's we're hearing two responses. And one group are saying, "Gosh, throw in the towel, let this thing immunize the world." And we have another group that are saying, and this is led by Maria wear a mask, get vaccinated. If we make the wrong choice, and the first one is the wrong choice, people are going to pay the price. They're going to be the healthcare workers trying to manage the system. They're going to be the older people who are going to die, as Michael said uh, previously, due to the uh, surging disease. They're going to be the other people who cannot access services that they need. This is a, have a look at that epidemic curve. In the face of something like that, you want to do everything you can slow this thing down and take the heat out of it. The other thing we have to remember is Omicron is not going to be the last variant. We don't know everything where this virus is going yet. And again, as Maria emphasizes uh, so many times, you, the more this thing can replicate the way it is now, the more likely we are to be dealing with other possibly even more challenging ones as we go forward. Um, we need to make the right choice right now. As Tedros has said before, you know, the way forward, it's, uh, it's uh, you don't leave it up to chance. We have a choice here, and the choice is wear a mask, get vaccinated, do everything you can to slow this thing down so others don't pay a price. Thank you very much, both. Next question goes to Latika Burke from Sydney Morning Herald. Latika, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year, team. Uh, you will obviously have seen the controversy that Novak Djokovic has caused trying to enter Australia and not being vaccinated. And I wanted to ask the WHO's view on vaccine mandates, because we are going to run into this quite often in the future now, where people will deliberately choose not to be vaccinated. But in many countries, there are mandates and they can lose their jobs or be excluded from things. Uh, does the WHO back excluding people from their work uh, places or indeed uh, professional sports people from playing in competitions if they are not vaccinated? Thank you very much, Latika. We'll go to Dr. Mike Ryan. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, uh, others may wish, uh, wish to add. Um, in general, I'm, I'm speaking even beyond uh, COVID vaccines, uh, WHO, uh, always uh, ask governments uh, to be cautious around the issue of mandatory vaccination. Uh, because in most situations, uh, many people who are hesitant about taking vaccines have genuine questions that need to be answered. There's information they need to make a good decision. So the issue of vaccine mandates uh, becomes an issue when a government or when a public health authority has 
has a clear public health goal which vaccine is required to reach that goal. If that goal cannot be reached because of a high level of people not wishing to take the vaccine, then sometimes uh, governments are in a position where in order to benefit society through reduced suffering and death, there is a need to bring in measures that uh, incentivize people to take the vaccine uh, or in some cases uh, have some, uh, some requirement that a vaccine is, is taken or given. Um, we have extensive guidance on that through our ethics group. It's very well laid out and it, it really clearly states that all measures should have been taken in advance of a mandate to ensure that everyone is adequately informed, that people have the opportunity and time to be vaccinated. Uh, and that clearly the public health outcome and the social outcome and the population outcome of a mandate greatly outweighs the disruption to any individual right or any individual freedom. Uh, and that has to be carefully balanced. Uh, so yes, there are circumstances in which vaccine mandates uh, are supported by WHO, but it again is subject to the basic principle that the best way to get people vaccinated is to inform them, to educate, to have a dialogue, and address people's genuine concerns when it comes to information and knowledge about vaccination, especially for them, their families, their children, their parents uh, and community. Uh, so WHO's position, I think, is, is pretty clear. We see mandates as a last resource in the face, and we've seen, for example, in the last number of months with Delta and Omicron, in the face of a large epidemic in which we know that vaccines will save lives, and we know that vaccines are life-saving. Uh, some countries, uh, having done all that they can to convince people to be vaccinated by any other means, uh, feel that in order for schools, in order for workplaces to function, in order for transport to function, in order for society to function, and in order to save the maximum number of lives, they bring in mandates. We always ask that those mandates be clear, be explicit, be time limited, uh, and at the same time to be accompanied by the appropriate risk communication and clarification and the governments continue to explain to people why they're doing things and continue to try and convince people uh, of the benefits of vaccine rather than uh, reverting to mandates as a, as a single approach. I'm sure Kate has something to say about this, but that will be WHO's principal position on this matter. Mike, I think you've, uh, you've summarized that extremely well. The one thing that I, I think is really important to add to the issue around vaccine mandates is, uh, of course, there can be absolutely no uh, situation of a mandate where access to a vaccine is not fully and freely available to those who would otherwise um, be subject to the conditions of the mandate. And I think this is um, one of the most important parts about our principles in WHO. Uh, around this general issue of mandates. Um, this has come up not only for COVID vaccines, but for other vaccines as well. And access is uh, free and full access to uh, safe and effective vaccines is the, uh, the, the absolute precondition before any consideration of a mandate is made. And that is um, a grounding principle. It's also uh, a grounding reason why um, uh, one of the reasons why uh, there is uh, 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 not a requirement um, from WHO uh, recommendation around any requirement for crossing international borders, although the, um, the status of somebody's vaccination uh, uh, status may be considered by countries with respect to other uh, conditions that may be um, uh, imposed on people um, through the course of their travel. So I just really want to emphasize this issue about vaccine access um, as a, an absolute precondition for any consideration of mandates. Thank you both very much. Next question goes to Simon Ateba from Today's News Africa. Um, Simon, please unmute yourself. Thank you for taking my question and Happy New Year. This is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington. Last week, Dr. Tedros, talks, Dr. Tedros talked about the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Tigray and elsewhere in Ethiopia. On Monday, President Biden spoke by phone with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed at the same time that the government there was bombing women and children in Tigray. I was just wondering if you could give us an update, especially since more bombs are dropping in Tigray. Does the WHO have access? Is there any other way that you can reach the people suffering there, dying? Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And, um, um, 
Go to I can begin, if it was me, a supplement. Um, I, I, I think Dr. Tedros's statement at the last press conference was very clear. The situation hasn't changed since then. If anything, the situation has got worse. So the simple answer to your question, Simon, and Happy New Year to you, is no. Uh, our access has not improved. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, it's, it's, it's very upsetting here because we look at these numbers and we look at all of this, but we've had contact from, from doctors working in, 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 in Tigray, doctors working with patients with diabetes and, and other diseases. And, and when you hear personal reports of the fact that we haven't been able to get basic insulin and diabetic treatments into Tigray since last summer, the end of last summer, that they, at one point uh, uh, almost uh, insulin is almost stocked out, entirely stocked out. The, the oral anti-diabetic drugs are almost unavailable. They're, they're running out of IV fluids for, for, for managing uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. The, the doctors and nurses in, in, in northern Ethiopia and Tigray can't even manage the most severe complications of a disease as, like diabetes, which has catastrophic, immediate health consequences for people. It's, 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 it's incredible as a, as a physician, as, as someone who uh, commits their lives to caring for others. I, I, the politics of it are beyond me. The issue is that there are people, real, uh, you know, people living in a situation, whatever they situation who have no access to the very basic life-saving interventions that we in the West, that we sitting here in Geneva would expect immediately, instantly, if we were to fall ill or sick. Uh, and, and from my perspective, uh, th th this is an insult to our humanity to, to allow a situation like this to, to continue, to allow no access, zero access. Uh, Dr. Tedra said in a speech uh, at the last uh, press conference that Access is the lifeblood, the starting point for humanitarian intervention. And we do not, simply do not have that access. Access for our staff, access to the, to, to the, to the field, uh, getting basic medical supplies in there. So um, it's, it's truly important that all parties involved in this find a solution to allow humanitarian workers, doctors and nurses, to do their job, which is to treat patients and save lives. And simply again, Simon, to be very clear, no, the situation is not getting any better since Dr. Tedros spoke before. It's getting worse. Uh, thank you, Mike. And um, thank you also, si Simon, for that very important question. Um, as Mike said, the situation hasn't improved. Uh, it's actually uh, getting more complicated and deteriorating. Uh, we just received, uh, by the way, a letter from a physician, which we don't know, earlier today. And maybe I would uh, like to read part of what he said uh, in that message. I'm very sure that you have been following up the terrible and unimaginable stories of patients in Tigray that have been broadcast in the media. As to diabetes management, we have not received any medication after June 2021. We have so far been using the stock we had before, we, before and starting from September, we have started using expired anti-diabetic drugs, expired drugs. And our treatment has recently focused on preventing acute complications we have stopped being concerned about good glycemic control and preventing chronic complications. We almost do not discuss about diet with patients as they have to eat whatever is available. From the report we got from our pharmacy head, we have learned that we are left with 150 vials of NPH and few strips of glipanclamide and other drugs, of course, which he mentions. And he says, the sad part is, we have even have run out of the expired drugs. The expired drugs are also finished. With the limited amount of drugs that we have, we will be able to serve for only two to three days, the next two to three days. These are the expired, actually. And to make things worse, we have run out of IV fluid 
So we are treating even moderate and severe DKA with free water. No IV fluids so or free water. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. I think I don't want to um, take your time uh, reading uh, all the message, but it, you can see from uh, this physician how desperate the situation is. Imagine because you don't have IV fluid and you're using tap water. Um, I have said it before, um, you know, Tigray, the region, which is uh, a, a region, a Tigray regional state in Ethiopia, with a population of 7 million people. Its population is, by the way, almost equivalent to Norway and Estonia combined. And this region has been under siege for more than a year. Imagine a complete blockade of 7 million people for more than a year, and there is no food, there is no medication, no medicine, no electricity, no telecom, no media, nobody can report. And when there is no telephone, I think accessing families is difficult. No cash, no bank service. And imagine the impact of all this on health. Lack of medicine has direct impact and people are dying. But lack of food also kills. And on top of that, daily drone attacks is killing people. I think three days ago, more than 50 were killed, civilians, including children. And yesterday, more than 17 were killed. This is a daily event. And people are living under constant fear. And you can imagine how that impacts also the health of people, mental health. And when drugs are not available, having all these wounded civilians, you can imagine where they can get the support or treatment they can. From our side, we have been trying, from WHO side, trying to have access to send drugs to Tigray and the other affected areas by the conflict, Afar and Amhara regions, we were permitted to send medicines to Afar region and Amhara region while we were not allowed to send to Tigray region. We have approached the Prime Minister's office, we have approached the Foreign Ministry, we have approached all relevant sectors, but no permission. So there is a blatant measure which has been taken, that's blockade and siege for more than a year, 7 million people. And since especially July, no medication was allowed from WHO, none whatsoever. One thing we know is measles vaccines from UNICEF a few weeks ago, but I don't think measles vaccines would do anything. That's why I said last week in our, in our presser, this has to stop. Humanitarian access, even in conflict, is the basis, the basics. Even in Syria, we have access, even during the worst of conflicts in Syria. In Yemen, the same, we have access. We deliver medicines. Here, it's a complete, complete blockade, especially since mid-July, nothing. This is six months without medical support, without food, without all the rest of the things I have said, it's impossible. Of course, I'm from that region. I'm from Tigray, northern part of Ethiopia. But I'm saying this without any bias. What I'm saying is the truth. What I'm saying is what's happening. What I'm saying is the situation is serious. Nowhere in the world you would find a crisis like what you see in the northern part of Ethiopia, especially in Tigray. None, no, nowhere in the world are we witnessing hell like in Tigray. And the international community has to do everything. The basics is 
to have unfettered access, whether it's food or medicine. Humanitarian access should be allowed at all times, even during conflict. Even conflict cannot be an excuse because we're delivering medicine in conflict areas while the conflict is raging. So that place cannot be different. And then the other part, of course, this thing should be resolved politically, peacefully. If there is a commitment to resolve it peacefully, there is a way. There is a way to resolve it peacefully and politically. And we know that just respecting the constitutional order, the constitution would bring this problem into a peaceful conclusion. And the most courageous choose peace. So ultimately, it's a political solution or peace, which is the answer. But as I speak now, we're deeply concerned from WHO side. We have tried all our best, but we're blocked from sending medicines to Tigray, Ethiopia. And that's so dreadful and unimaginable during this time, 21st century, when a government is denying its own people for more than a year food and medicine and the rest to survive. I thank you. And Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. With this, we come to the next question. That goes to Stefan Boussard from Le Ton. Stefan, please unmute yourself. Yes, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, you've been talking about a situation which is not any better in terms of uh, vaccine access, uh, about the, the staggering infection rate. But on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, talks about the midterm and long-term impact of the Omicron variant on the evolution of the pandemic. Do you think there's a chance that we might move maybe at the end of the spring from the fake to an endemic situation? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. We'll start with Dr. Van Kerkhove. Mike? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, as I said in a previous answer, we're looking at various scenarios going forward in terms of how um, this virus, how this pandemic will evolve in the coming weeks to the coming months. Um, we have a lot of information about how this virus behaves, how it spreads. We're learning every day more and more about Omicron itself, uh, how Omicron is introduced into a population, what the population level immunity is in that, in that area, in that country. Uh, the vaccination coverage, et cetera. And we're seeing um, Omicron um, uh, outcompete Delta in, in many populations where Omicron is becoming more uh, prominent compared to Delta. Um, to be able to predict what will happen in the spring depends on many different factors. And again, um, it is up to us how this pandemic unfolds. This virus is on its way to becoming endemic. There's no question about that, but we are very much right now in the middle of this pandemic. At transmission levels that we see right now, at the intensity of spread that we see, at the level of impact that these cases are having on our essential medical services, on essential services, um, on hospitalization rates, which are increasing in a number of countries. And now certainly we see less uh, uh, rates of hospitalization, but the sheer volume of cases is really putting a heavy burden on our healthcare systems. So the impact that we are seeing is really quite substantial. Um, the big question is not necessarily how sharp and how quickly that peak will be in every country because we see a consistent vertical uh, trajectory where Omicron is. And if you remember with Delta, when that emerged, we had a similar trajectory, but we didn't have this level of, a, of the top of that peak. This is, this is off the charts. Um, how we come down from that, how we turn that peak and the case numbers go down, I think will depend on a number of things as it relates to uh, vaccination coverage, as it relates to population level immunity from past infection, as it relates to the interventions that are in play. 
Um, so the virus, you know, is well on its way to becoming endemic, but we're not there yet. The other factor that we have to consider is that this virus has, um, is, still, is still evolving. So what will the next variant look like? Um, and as you've heard us say many times, um, this will likely not be the next variant that you hear us speak about. So we have a little bit of an unpredictability. We don't have the same predictability like we have with influenza where we have a, a, a typical seasonal pattern. We may get there with uh, COVID-19, but we're not there yet. Um, so we're cautious about making uh, very firm predictions about what may happen because each country is dealing with this pandemic differently in terms of their strategy, in terms of the implementation of their control measures, in terms of their adjustment of those control measures. And what we need is a collective renewal. The DG said this in his last, I think, as we can. So again, it's up to us how this unfolds. Um, we look at various scenarios going forward in terms of what we expect. We expect, number one, that the virus will continue to evolve uh, and, and become more fit, uh, more or less severe. Uh, we will have to see what happens as this virus evolves. Second, we expect to see outbreaks among unvaccinated individuals, among people who are not well protected. Um, we expect as population increases, uh, as population mixing increases, and as other respiratory pathogens are circulating, like influenza, for example, we expect that there will be concurrent outbreaks of other diseases because people are mixing. So we have to plan for that and ensure that our surveillance is integrated for respiratory disease surveillance. Um, and we expect um, that we can reduce severe disease and death by using vaccination, but also by improving clinical care, getting people into that clinical care pathway. How that actually unfolds depends on how we use the interventions at hand. So there's a lot at play. It's very dynamic, um, but it's up to us. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Um, looking at the time, it looks like we made it to the hour. Uh, thank you again very much, everybody, for joining today. Um, apologies for the initial hiccup with the list of codes. Um, we will be sending the audio files and Dr. Tedros' remarks again right after the press briefing, and the full transcript will be posted on the WHO website tomorrow morning. Uh, with this, let me close and give it back to Dr. Tedros for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, and uh, thank you to all uh, media colleagues who have uh, joined today, and see you next time.